So my name is um, Shara Ali. I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the Understanding and Celebrating Race Equality Working Group at Queen Mary, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Patrick Vernon, who is the final of our speakers for Black History Month. So let me just say a little bit about uh, Patrick, if I may. It's quite difficult to distill in a couple of paragraphs, but here we go. Patrick was recently appointed independent non-executive director of Birmingham and Solihull, where he leads ICS, where he leads on Equalities Chair of Citizenship Partnership for HSIB and non-executive director of Hertfordshire NHS Trust. He is also Associate Director for Connected Communities for the Centre for Aging Better. He's also a Claw and Winston Churchill Fellow, Fellow of Goodenough College, Fellow of Imperial War Museum, Fellow of Royal Historical Society, and former Associate Fellow for the Department of History of Medicine at Warwick University. Uh, sorry, Patrick, Solihull ICS? Integrated Care uh, Service. Okay. So, yeah, it's, a new, it's a new commissioning model for commissioning healthcare in, right. uh, around the country. So I'm on the, on the board of the Birmingham Solihull one, yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, Patrick was awarded an OBE in 2012 for his work on tackling health inequalities in ethnic minority communities. Since 2010, he's been leading the campaign for National Windrush Day and in 2018, kickstarted the campaign for an amnesty for the Windrush generation as part of the Windrush scandal. It's a great uh, honour for us to have you with us at Queen Mary, Patrick. Thank you so much. Um, before we go on to the topic of today, which is the Sewell race report, and I'm sure you'll say a little bit about what that is for those who are uninitiated and structural racism, I just wanted to ask you, within the context of Black History Month, which is why we're here, um, what does, if anything, Black History Month mean to you? And can you tell us about a, a figure or two from the movement who who perhaps even inspires you? Yeah, well, unashamedly, um, I think this book, 100 Great Black Britons, came out last year, uh, hardback, and the paperback came out a few weeks ago. So in this book, it's based on the campaign I did um, 18 years ago, but the book itself is more recent. Um, and there are quite a few people in this book which we featured, uh, like Bernard Grant, the late Bernard Grant MP, is one of my uh, personal heroes um, as well. There's um, a, a load of Equiano, a black abolitionists. Often people talk about William Wilberforce, but never talk about him. Um, there's Claudia Jones, uh, who um, founded the West Indian Gazette, and also was involved in setting, the, in the early foundations, I'd say, of the of the Nottingham Carnival. Um, there is, um, in here, there's a late Dame Jocelyn Barrow, who played a key role campaign for the 1965 Race Relations Act. Uh, there's quite a few people uh, in there, so if you want to find more, the book, on the Great Black Prisons. Fantastic, thanks for that. And Black History Month? Uh, yeah, well, it's been going for 34 years, and obviously, um, hopefully it'll continue much longer. I mean, obviously, it's more than a month, because some people just call it Black History Month season, and they do it from October, especially the museum, the museum and archives, do it from the start, the programming in October, finishes up to about January, February. So um, it's still important, it's still relevant. Uh, I think there's been a rena renaissance around Black History Month over the last two years because of what happened with the murder of George Floyd, um, uh, as well, and ironically, the Tony Sub report uh, and the Windrush scandal, all these have actually influenced more people want to know more about Black British history. So that's why I think it's this year, there's been loads of events this year. A majority of them are, have been online, um, as well. Great, so it's still, relevant, still important. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you very much. So let's um give you an opportunity now to tell us about the SEAL report, um, structural racism. And hopefully that will take us up to or just after half past one, and then we'll leave plenty of time for questions from those in attendance today. And when you're asking questions, I'll just ask you to raise your hand and you can open your um, video camera as well if you're happy to be recorded and you know ask your question. Great. Over to you, Patrick. Yeah, I mean, I think people should be aware of the Tony Sewell report, I imagine. It's had a lot of media coverage even before the report was published last year. Uh, this year, I should say March, um, at the height of Black Lives Matter, Boris Johnson was, was asked quite a few times in the media, what is the government's response to Black Lives Matter? Uh, the initial response was 
particularly um, they just ignored it. And then when Colson statue was removed uh, in Bristol, then there was this, that's when I think the cultural wars kicked off. You had the likes of Priti Patel more concerned about Churchill's statue than black lives and brown lives. Um, when, then Boris Johnson did talk about the importance of Winston Churchill. But people kept asking him questions all the time. What were, you know, there are two million people in Britain marching peacefully, showing allyship around issues of uh, racism in Britain, not just in America, but now we're talking about Britain. And he reluctantly, I believe, decided he had to do something. And what most politicians do when they're pushed in the corner, you have an inquiry or an investigation or a commission, basically to buy time. Um, and so they pointed, uh, he pointed to Saul. I'm not telling this Saul, I'm not telling Saul for many years. Um, and um, he was appointed and, uh, and then they appointed the range of commissioners. And what was quite apparent from his appointment and all the other people that were appointed, um, that they weren't going to look at the key issues that was raised in the Black Lives Matter movement about structural racism. Black Lives Matter is about structural racism, enslavement, history of enslavement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Black humanity, you call it what you like, and it has it, and it's how it has an impact on other communities. Um, that was they what did they didn't want to answer that, that particular exam question. So the exam question they looked at was. Um, we want to look at racial disparities. Now, um, racial disparities, I mean, I work in my background, I've worked in health, health inequalities, and often when we talk about racial disparities in healthcare, it's often very neutralised or seen as objective in a sense that we're not quite sure if it really exists, but we have to do some research work to demonstrate if there are health inequalities or inequalities or disparities. So the title itself, if the title said that we're looking at structural racism in Britain, then you know where they're going to come from. But when they use the word racial disparities, then you knew that they were going down a completely different track, which had now been proven after 18 months. So they pointed, and all the commissioners that were appointed, as well as Tony Saul, they have a very, very their worldview is one of, they don't recognise structural racism. All of them have track records on form. They've either written about it, quoted about it um, as well. So. And it wouldn't have been so bad if they had a um, diverse political research perspectives. And you know, even if they came to the same conclusion, most people might say, OK, a uh, fair cop. Not, well, not, well, not in a fair cop, but at least some kind of summation of that there was, a, there was a degree of probity challenge. But when you've, if everyone's got the same worldview, there's no challenge. There's no probity. There's no real independence because you does it, we are diverse people. We're diverse in our thoughts and our considerations, basically. So the very fact that everyone had the same worldview, they didn't believe in shock racism. We all knew that the report was going to go a certain direction, and that's what happened. So um, they were very selective in the type of evidence they wanted and who they spoke to, and they were very selective in cherry-picking evidence from people who never gave evidence or gave the impression that they were going to give evidence on something different, but they were misled. So if you talk about it from a very, well put this way, if you, if, if you, if this was considered um, as a thesis at your university, um, you'd probably, you, you, not only would you fail, you'd probably um, bring criminal charges or, and get and, and sue and you know, whatever it is. I mean, if you're going on doing that basis, or if you were doing a viva, you fail the viva, basically. Uh, it's on that level. Uh, because in terms of university research, it's about objectivity, it's about you balance the evidence, then you have your conclusions. You might agree with the conclusions, but you go through a process to demonstrate that. That didn't, I mean, if you compare the Sewell report to other um, similar processes looking at racial disparity, racial discrimination, such as the Lamb Review, the Alex Vernon Review, and Deaths in Custody, go far back as. Um, uh, even though even the lessons learnt review done by Windu Williams on the Winner scandal, which I all of them had a fair amount, a fair degree of objectivity, rigor, and analysis, and that is why people quote those reports all the time as evidence to demonstrate how the Winner's generation were treated appallingly by the Home Office, 
black and brown people stuck in the criminal justice system, deaths in custody, etc. You get a far back as the McPherson inquiry. Uh, again, all these have been robust, but this process was not robust. It was dodgy. It's almost like you go to um, you go to uh, a, a, a car salesman, and he and he sells you a dodgy car, which is spelled MOT. You forge an MOT certificate, um, and 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 you're and you're kind of lied to basically. That's what that's what and, you know gaslighting. That's the way that a lot of people saw it. So I think the report itself. When it was eventually, it was delayed, and one of the reasons why it was delayed was because it was because of COVID. That was one of the reasons why it was delayed. Uh, maybe that might be the case. I think I think it was delayed because they had to rewrite the report, and we found that afterwards that the report was actually written, or a good part of it was written at number ten. So there's not objectivity. The whole idea you have an inquiry process is you you know okay people might have links to the political parties of the organised of the of the government that's, that's commissioned it. We know that it happens on the Labour Conservative. That's nothing new about that. But you still expect a degree of rigour and a degree of integrity integrity at least. And if number 10 were rewriting the report or parts of the report, then you know full well that it was designed to and the report was designed to nullify Black Lives Matter in the UK. And to nullify all those ally, all those woke people, and to you know basically, and it failed actually. And the reason why it failed because the report wasn't robust enough. No matter what the government said, and, the, and when a report was launched, said this is a model report, we can actually well, actually with what they were saying or Boris Johnson was saying, we can actually export how successful models to Britain is. That's what they were more or less saying, basically. Patrick, um, Patrick, I'm just gonna um, intervene. I'm just gonna. Uh, ask a question, uh, if I may. Yeah, sure. Because I, I know you like a good provocation, and having heard you before, when you're sometimes up against advocates of this report, I just wanted to, from what you've said so far, it sounds like you're saying going down the racial disparity route is a bit of a cop out, and within your field, you get that. And yeah. I just want you, could you just explicate the difference between racial disparity and structural racism, which in the terms of reference, that was the objective and it wasn't met. Yeah. And yeah. also say a bit more around um, why you think they've done that. Is it basically they don't want to uncover these uncomfortable truths? Is it that their heart was never in it or have they been hoodwinked by somebody? You've also said a little bit about, you know, what you might call low level corruption in the way that the way the, the, the report is actually drafted at the end stage and the input that goes into it, which damages its integrity. Yeah, uh, there is a big difference between uh, disparities and structural racism. I mean, ironically, as a result of COVID-19, all of a sudden you start to hear health professionals in the Royal Colleges and other institutes now acknowledging for the first time structural racism. Prior to COVID-19, that was never ever acknowledged um, at all. There were, people always talk about racial disparities or inequalities, which often means there is something wrong with your lifestyle, why you've got um, mental health problems or diabetes or chronic heart disease. And yes, and there is an element of lifestyle. We know that, about choices, what we eat, and, and health, uh, exercise, and all that kind of stuff. We know that. But also, because there's been, over the last 20, 30 years, been increasing body evidence of work, particularly in America, about the impact of racism on people's physical health and mental health. In this country, we don't even go there. We just talk about the consequences of racism and it's still, and, it's, and the answer is always, it's your lifestyle, it's your choices, basically. Uh, and so that is the rationale in most of, in a lot of public discourse around inequalities in Britain, health inequality stuff, stuff around education, stuff around housing, you name it. Um, but because of COVID-19, and, and and combined with Black Lives Matter, these institutions are now acknowledging structural racism properly for the first time, whereas before then they always would dot the issue. So the very fact that like the Royal College of Psych even the Royal College of Psychiatrists believe it or not have acknowledged structural racism, and yet this process done by Tony Saul is going the opposite direction. Tony Saul, I really believe some people do really believe that there's not structural racism. I've shared the platforms, and you know that I've had this conversation, and they believe that yes, there is discrimination, but there's no structural racism. 
So there are some people who genuinely absolutely believe that. And that's fine. That's their worldview. I respect that. Different from what, my worldview, but I acknowledge that. There are some people who've been hoodwinked and lied to. And some people are in it because they want to get recognition, like honours or whatever it is they want. So it's a, it's a combination of all of those, to be quite honest, basically. And that's why the report is dodgy. Uh, I'm not for all, but for that, because of no property as well. Um, it does not stand up in the public se in the public discourse around public thinking uh, around a recommendation or a report. And I don't understand why when I go to some of these events, everyone says it's a fantastic report. I know why they're saying it, because they have to, because it's the only report in town that 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 they can that they feel comfortable in talking about race without talking about structural racism, basically, if you know what I mean. And um, having worked in this arena for many years, what kind of report were you, well, I'm not saying you would have expected better, but what would you have liked to have seen and what would your solutions be? Do you think that these solutions are already known? Well, I mean, this is go, so going back to the report itself, the report came up with a number of recommendations, so we can't just completely poo-poo some of because some of the recommendations they cut they cut and paste from other reports. So, like some of the reports, some of the recommendations came from uh, the Lamy Review and, and other uh, stuff. So we have to acknowledge that you know that some of the recommendations have, have degrees of validity. So I wouldn't completely. I mean, some people say we should completely burn it. I mean, yeah, I think we're part of it should burn, but there are some useful bits in there. Um, there are some parts of the report which uh, is actually uh, simply said we need to do more research work, more evidence. When in actual fact that evidence is there already, but they didn't make the effort to engage with that. You know what I mean? And then some of the report and uh, some parts of the report are really, really dodgy. So the bits that really I I scrutinised, and I've actually written articles about this it's online, basically everyone. Uh, I've written stuff on Iron News and the, and the Voice newspaper that that they played down the impact of uh, slavery, enslavement. They actually said actually we should change the narrative and it should be we should people should be um, look at the positives. What, why my ancestors were enslaved? Now, if that was referred to someone to the Jewish community around the Holocaust, there would be clear accusations of anti-Semitism. When it comes to us, it seems okay. You know what I mean? So there's, you know, I, I, saw, I find that an aphorism and a, a, to someone actually saying slavery wasn't that bad, really. Outrageous, completely outrageous. Um, and Tony, then later on, Tony still had to backtrack on that and say, oh, you didn't really mean what I'm said by that. But that was really, that was, a, that's deliberate narrative. I mean, people always accuse people, particularly on the left and, um, and anti-racist, as trying to rewrite history. They were rewriting history in that report, saying that um, the slavery wasn't that bad, really. It was character character building. What, was, what does that mean, character building? You're not going on The Apprentice, by the way, saying character building, or Dragon's Den, please. So, so it was really, really dodgy. And the reason why that bit was written there, because some of the commissioners have a direct interest in, in preserving that history of the legacy of slavery to justify capitalism. Basically, so you know, so it's so that's why the report is completely. But uh, the only thing that people agreed with the report was about the use of the word "bane," and actually that was trailed about three or four days before the report came out. So and now we know, now we know why because that was that was the only best bit of the report. <laughs> don't, I mean, it's an obvious thing. Don't use the word "bane." I mean, you know, but then they come up with alternatives. So I'm not quite sure what we're going to do. People still saying "bane" anyway. Now, if they kept with alternative, that would be different, but they don't use the word bane. Well, we know that. Please. So um, the, the main bit of the report, which they really talk a lot about, is how, about the ed educational stuff. The rest of the report, around stop and search, discredited by everyone. The health inequalities bit discredited by everyone. The only bit of the report which they've tried to really justify hard, and all the conferences are always around that, that chapter, is the educational one. And even with that one, it's still circumspect because it's what it's trying to say is if you're Chinese and Indian, you're OK, you're doing well, you're, you're model British people. If you're African, you're OK, you're not, you're not so bad. If you're Black Caribbean, there's no hope for you in a nutshell. What does that tell you? 
And then, and then while they're talking about white working class youth, the report wasn't about white working class youth, it was looking at racial disparities, basically. Unless white people are now be, are BAME. That's fine, that's a BAME, then we're all BAME, aren't we? I mean, in terms of what you're asking, what the report should come up with, there are lots of reports um, which have looked at the issues of structural racism in health, higher education, in business. Um, they, could have, they could have approached some of the people that have been involved in those reports, to be quite honest, but they didn't do that at all. I've been heavily involved in the Munra scandal, one of the biggest travesties of human rights abuses for a good half a century. In that Sewell report, there's only one sentence about the Windrush scandal. Hold on, what's wrong there? The Windrush scandal that even still dominates the news today. Uh, you know, uh, not, um, um, but yet yeah, in this report on racial disparities, there's just one line about it as if it didn't exist. So that's why the report is not doing it for a lot of people. And actually the report has done us a favour. The report has energised the anti-racist world. There have been more talks on anti-racism in the last two years than there ever been before because of the Sewell report and obviously Black Lives Matter. I've done various talks um, during Black History Month. For the first time ever, I've done a number of talks with a number of private sector companies, corporates. They're, re they're, they're actually re Vitalizing doing their EDI strategies, despite the government's report. You know, same with local governments, same with the NHS. So in many ways, the report has kind of, because the report was so bad, people realised that we could do something, we could, we could do better than that, we can be better than this. And that's what's happened. If the report was successful, then half these organisations would either be dropping their various strategies or adopting similar strategies which have been suggested in the Sewell report. OK, um, Patrick, I think we're going to move to some questions now. Thank you so much for your insight yeah. uh, into the report. And let, let's go to a discussion. I've got many questions left, but uh, over to, to you guys. Just raise your hand and take the floor. If you raise your hand, I'll call you. Um, if you just want to take the floor. That's also fine. Don't be shy. We found that um, discussion really gets going by the end and people have left it too late. So don't be shy. Come on, who's going to go first? Hi there, if I could jump in. Um, I thank you so much for your talk and your insights. And I think, you know, I, I share a lot of your frustration and infuriation. I feel a bit stuck and I guess my question to you is what do you think the next steps are? Where do we go from here? I kind of feel like we're kind of going round in circles and not much is happening. I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, where do we go from here? We just carry on what we're doing. Basically, whatever you're doing, you carry on what you're doing. That's what everyone, that's what I'm doing. I'm carrying on what I'm doing. I'm still doing work on race quality and racism. I'm still doing what I'm doing. It's not put me off, to be quite honest, uh, in many ways. I mean, we're just, it's just important that we have a government that's not interested in this agenda. When they start talking about, when, when one government minister calls rape, critical race theory a political ideology, you know, there's, you know, you know they've lost it. Uh, you know what I mean? So I think we'll just continue what we're doing. We're influenced. I mean, the, if you looked at um, the time of Thatcherism, the, probably the greatest policies on socialist, social action and activism and art, creativity and culture was during the, was during the factory years. So it's actually inspired people, basically. And I think that's what's happening now with this government. People ask, you know, there is no trust with this government, the way they handled the pandemic. You know, even, you know, but even a lot of people don't have that trust with the government. A lot of people are just doing their own stuff. A lot of people are like, what can we do in our neighbourhoods, in our communities of interest, in our circles, to have a better Britain, despite this government? Thanks for your question, Georgina. Did you, do you want to come back? Or, Eleanor, you look like you were opening your mic there.
who'd like to go next? Or did you have a response to that, Georgina? No, I just wanted to say thank you, because I think from, from, from my perspective, I felt that the report undermined a lot of what we were doing. And I think that with the whole Black Lives, with the whole you know murder of George Floyd, I think a lot of people were more open and understanding and, and wanted to get involved in reducing the gaps and the inequalities. And then I think this report undermined a lot of that work and initiative. But I do think, Patrick, you're right in that it galvanizes and it motivates people when we know <laughs> we know that this is a whole load you know it doesn't make any sense that the outcome of this report so if anything use it as fuel for um the work that we're doing so i appreciate that thank you any other takers good uh Marjorie yes. can you Go. hear me yes absolutely loud and clear OK, thank you. Um, thank you, Patrick, um, for what you've just shared. I, I can hear your frustration in terms of where the blockages are. And I think, you know, even sessions like this where just an hour is allocated, it just goes to, to, to sort of highlight the importance of how we consider um, in, in regards to Black Lives Matter. Um, I was very disappointed when I heard about the report and I have family who have been through sort of like the Windrush generation and also um, family members overseas who contacted me and um, were very disappointed to, 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 to hear the report from the other side, because as much as we're here, we're living in the UK, we kind of see things from a different perspective and we come here to, we, we sort of adapt to the way of living over here, but we're trying to transform something that has been embedded for centuries. Mm -hmm. And that within itself is challenging. We we heard about the um, the big fight in in London um, where people lost their lives, and you know, so many of these incidents just keep happen. And it it takes people going out and doing malicious things to sort of demonstration and stuff like that to be heard. And this is what happened with the George Floyd there had to be a demonstration for, for bigger heads to, to sort of recognise. And I know that there's been a few um, sort of freedom walks within London, but then it stops. You know, it, does it mean that we need to continue doing more of that? Is that what we need to be consistent with? I know you said you've gone back to doing your little bit in your little corner, but how many times are we going to have George Floyd incidents happening for us to be able to rise up and then settle down again. There needs to be a consistent pressure from my perspective. What do you think about that? Well, that's what I'm doing. I, I, that's what I do. Um, I'm working with a whole range of individuals, organisations, we're campaigning on different issues, raising different issues. Uh, to be quite, I'm still going. I'm still. I'm still campaigning around the rights of the next generation to so become a fair compensation scheme. I'm, you know, I'm involved in stuff around racial inequalities and mental health. So, I mean, you know, there's lots of people still doing stuff. Um, and that's what I'm trying to say to just keep on doing what you're doing. And, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it is frustrating on a certain level because, uh, but then again, if you look at the annals of black history or history of race equality and anti-racism, um, it's been a long, it's a long struggle. It's been a very long struggle in this country and the struggle sadly will still continue. Bear. But if I could respond in, in terms of it continuing, my 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 sort of frustration is what is it going to take for significant change? And I know since the, the, the incident with George Floyd that something has happened, but then again it's gone a little bit quiet again. And I just wonder because it is so embedded, and I work in the NHS as well, and it is so embedded that it is so subtle. And I know they're doing a whole lot of work around um, inclusion and inequalities and ensuring that everyone is a part of the, 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 the organization in terms of belonging. But what is it that needs to be done? How can we help our organization then to be able to say, OK, it's done, it's done subtle, like in a subtle way, but is there another way that we can highlight it so that 
it's, it's almost like we need um, a big thud to get the heart going again instead of the, the, the CPR, small CPR compression. You just need this big thud to allow something to, to, to miraculously start and then work on it from that end. As I said before, if you look at the annals of black history, it's been a slow process. That's the nature of stuff that happens in Britain. So we have, it's like one step forward, two steps back, one step forward and all that kind of stuff. That's what happens. If you look at any of the changes in legislation, policy and law, I mean, for example, I was involved in the whole window scandal. Window scandal is quite unusual. Even though it's been bubbling for quite a while, the, very, the, the change in government policy in the space of 12 months of 2018 to 2019 um, was because the government was ashamed, in, not just in the UK, but internationally were embarrassed. It was like being was the laughing stock. That's why the government has, that's why the, keep, that's why, that's why the government still apologises. But even with that, um, it's still not enough, you know, because the, the justice has not been given to the Windows generation still, um, to be quite honest. So, but you have to, can, I mean, I've done six petitions against government on Windows in the last three years. And some have been successful, some haven't been successful. I'm, I'm not the only one, by the way, there's other people doing stuff as well. Uh, and, you know, and now there are lots of lawyers getting ready to take the government to court. Uh, on doing lots of judicial, so what you'll find in the news of the next phase of stuff will be lawyers now taking the government. Uh, so it's just ongoing you have to do. You have to, if you've got the energy and the tenacity, just keep going. That's all I can say. So you raise an interesting point there, Patrick, and you talked about um, shame almost as a driver or a motivation to overcome a deep set problem, you know, with with the Windrush scandal and the embarrassment. And I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas or techniques like that around or how would you overcome um, racist, racist prejudice? Are you direct or are you different strokes for different folks? Do you try and come at it more subtly? Do you understand that maybe it may be counterintuitive, but people aren't going to necessarily change for the right reasons, but they might change for uh, essentially uh, more trivial reasons. And this is why it's history. You spoke earlier about almost airbrushing the history of slavery in that report or, or the real impact of it because it can't be character building for somebody who dies through slavery. It's got to be character building for the next generation. So that's a bit of a nonsense. Um, isn't it the case that history is, is, is so important as a way of framing our understanding of what needs to happen? Yeah, I mean, you've answered the question. Uh, that's why I love history. That's why I do lots of different cultural history. I use lens of cultural history in my work run health inequalities and other issues because I think it's, history gives you context you can learn from the men and women who have done stuff 20 years ago 50 years ago 100 years ago 200 years ago 300 years etc etc to learn what they did and obviously we're in different times different conditions we're in the digital world um you know it's in a globalized world it's different from how how things were 100 200 years ago but there are still similar techniques racism is still there we just we just cut we it's a call the color bar we call it structural racism it's still the same issue it's still the impact it's still there uh the language is different we might be a bit more sophisticated uh or nuanced in our language but it's still the same impact and outcomes to be quite honest um and you know i've been involved in all kind of campaigns using petitions direct action all kind of stuff it depends on what the issue it, it all depends on what the what you want what's the objective of the campaign that you want to do to be quite honest uh it, um and that will influence stuff and sometimes it's about naming and shaming sometimes it's given a prod sometimes it's given a slap it depends really on the on uh, it depends on the cap in what you want what the objective is uh basically Anybody else like to ask a question or even just make a comment? Comments welcome. Anything you've heard? Hi, can I? My name's Andrea. Again, I'd like to thank you for your talk today. It, it's been very intriguing. Um, 
mine is more of a comment. I had a, I've, I've got a colleague who said to me, you know, why why do we still want to celebrate things like Black, Black History Month? Um, because doesn't that just drag up everything from the past and make us even more angrier? If we're trying to move forward, how can our children ever move forward if we're still they're still thinking about what have the events of the past. Now, I think it's quite clear from what, you know, we we said what you what you've just said here that history absolutely is important in order for us to be able to move forward. It, it's our foundation. If we don't have that, then where are where is there for us to go? You know, I the thing I said to my colleague was isn't it funny how all the British uh, we, we, you know, there's a day for everything that's happened in the British past. And yet this one thing that we have as black people all of a sudden shouldn't exist because as, as far as they are concerned, it's just dragging up things within us. It's helping us to try and find this equality that we so need. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And I, you're quite right. I mean, you know, you hear this, you know, I get, I get this stupid message on Twitter. Well, well, that White History Month. Well, what about it? You have it every day. Can't, we can't have about four weeks. You know what I mean? So, yeah, so I, I think it's, I mean, history, I mean, this country is obsessed with history, as you know. There's a complete obsession with history. And yet when we start talking about our history, oh, it's just too much. Thanks, Patrick. Short and pithy and to the point. Any further comments, questions? So whilst you're thinking of a question or a comment, um, so at Queen Mary, actually, um, well, we say that, uh, of course, we're proud of our diversity and we've got um, initiatives going on uh, in the EDI field. Quite a few departments or schools have uh, Black Lives Matters. They sometimes have been explicitly labelled that way. So I, I kind of recognise what's been said by one of our colleagues earlier around um, a momentum. Um, Georgina, I think it was. There may have been a momentum around uh, the George Floyd killing and an opportunity which is, which is almost being cancelled by, by the report. And so we need to overcome you know, that, that drawback and, and carry on. But how do you see Black Lives Matter as shaping institutions? And, and I, you know, you must have some insight into HEI as well. Where do you see the particular inertia within higher education? Uh, I, I'm not an expert on what's happening in the higher education world, to be quite honest. So you, you're probably in a much better position than I am. I mean, I can't, I can't comment on other sectors like local government, I've done some work with. A number of local authorities. I sit on a number of NHS boards, so I've got more of an insight than than that. I mean, uh, than high, apart from the only thing I know, what's happening in higher education is quite a few institutions are making cuts. The question is, if they make a cuts and reducing the number of lecturers and closing departments, what's have they done with public equality impact assessment? Will that disp will that disproportionately affect uh, black and minority ethnic staff in those in those in those settings? So a couple of things, a couple of things that um, we're looking at, which I think, you know, they've got currency across um, all sectors. So welcome your view on this. Firstly, language terminology. You mentioned BAME and, you know, we also probably distinguish between BA, e even just even just um, <laughs> even just using the term BAME as a word as opposed to BAME. You know, that's that's a, that's, you yeah. know carries different connotations um yeah. trying to bunch groups together uh, when there's quite a lot of difference in attainment within that group i think that's yeah. one you know one of the main challenges and yeah. certainly within queen mary as well we try and maybe even have the best of both worlds so i think the thing is that if we've got data which drills down into black africa being for example and different sets of um asian background we will do that and so we'll have a better evidence base on which to which to identify where the problem is so i think that's that's a good initiative also um a second one which i think you know across society that uh, we struggle with is the idea of what in other parts of the world you might call or america positive action right 
positive discrimination even, right? So, you know, we don't do that. That's unlawful. You can't exactly appoint the second best person on an interview panel simply because they're black. But do you see strategies around working with that? I mean, you might say that um, somebody who's broken through to a shortlist and is before you on a, on a panel uh, demonstrates probably um, great tenacity, you know, and determination to get to that point. Because we also know that on blind CVs, um, if we compare blind CVs to name CVs, if you've got um, you know, a black name, you're far less likely to, or an ethnic looking name, you're far less likely, up to 10 times less likely to um, get called to interview when you've got the same qualifications. So how do we overcome those kind of structural uh, barriers to um, greater participation and a meritocracy, a true meritocracy? Didn't the SEAL report say anything about this? Well, yeah, the, the SEAL report doesn't really talk about positive action at all, to be honest. And ironically, positive action is not used that much. You're quite right. You can't have positive discrimination uh, in that sense. But actually, we do practice positive discrimination in this country. It's called white privilege. That is positive discrimination. You're privileging other white people above over and above people, irrespective of whether they're talented or not. So that happens all the time, to be quite honest. But when we start talking about, well, what about us? Then they say it's all, it's positive discrimination. So, but there's positive action. It's in the statute books. And in that scenario that you gave of um, if there's two candidates, um, both, you know, they both are above the line, both are pointable. Um, you can justify positive action in pointing the black or the non ethnic candidate uh, uh, on the basis of how many people are in that structure in your organisation at that grade already. You can justify that. That's positive action. Both equal. Not if you know. It's not. It's not like one. If the if the if the black candidate or the whoever the candidate was below the line, and then you gave it. Then you gave them the job. That is. Then that obviously potentially that is discrimination. Even though in reality it happens all the time for white people, they get they get that stuff all the time. But you know that's how the law works. But if if they're both equal, both appointable, you can justify it through positive action that we appoint this person. Because if you look at the senior management team of this organisation, we have underrepresentation, and you can make that case. So so Patrick, I think that's an interesting example, though it's not exactly the one I gave. I was thinking of one where they're both above the line one of them is clearly the best candidate you wouldn't be able to appoint the second best candidate you would according to you right you can appoint somebody on the basis of their race shall we say if they're underrepresented in the organization and they're equal so it's almost like a tiebreaker yeah yeah but the reality is uh as i said to you before that positive there is positive discrimination but it works against us and you're calling that white privilege. And, 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 it's, it's endemic, right? You're calling that white yeah, privilege. Yeah, just look at look at FTSE 100 companies. Look at the NHS in terms of chief execs, medical directors. Uh, look at local governments. Look at look at your sector. Okay, we're going into the last. Unless we had a break in uh, signal there, I don't think we did. Um, we're going into the last um, few minutes now. Any Anybody else would like to contribute to the discussion? Yes, go ahead, Carol. Um, hi, hi there. Thank you, Patrick, for um, your engaging presentation. Um, I just wanted to um, ask what you thought about um, what's currently happening in the news with regards to the police and, um, you know, their abuse of power and so forth and all the actions that have been pledged and promised around the unfortunate um, murder of Sarah Adver um, Everard. What do you think it would take um, for similar pledges um, to be made um, around, you know, the the atrocities that you know black males and um black people in general have suffered at the hands of the police well we had that already it's called the first report yeah on the murder of stephen lawrence came up with 27 25 recommendations 
which were which were agreed by government. There was, a, there was a, an advisory committee established by Jack Straw to oversee the recommendations on the report, which the Lawrence, which both Neville and Dorian Lawrence were members of that committee, along with other people. They they introduced the Race Relations Amendment Act to recognising structural institutional racism and the public sector quality duty. The police at the time said that we are institutionally racist and we'll do the best that we can not to be institutionally racist. And then the backtracked. That's what happens. So all that stuff that was done in the 2000s, 10, 15 years ago, and you have a situation now where you have the you have Krista Dick, Krista Dick, who's charged of the Met Police, says that there's no institutional racism. The government says there's no institutional racism. You know, actually, they want to, actually what they've been doing since 2010. They've been trying to de, they're trying to reduce the impact of the quality legislation. They virtually reduced the budget of the Equality and Human Rights Commission by virtually two thirds. So they can't even do any legal action like they used to do back in the day, legal enforcement action, basically. Um, but interestingly enough, right, you mentioned about the several, several Everard murder, the way that should, uh, the, the, the murder of that police officer, uh, and then the, and also more importantly about the two black women that were their bonds were found. Um, in um, I think was it Monks Park in Brent, um, and the way that they were, the way that the police didn't treat that as a proper investigation compared to Everard, they were even taking pictures of the dead bodies and doing selfies of black women that were murdered. Yeah, so that has now the whole stuff around that had put a lot of pressure on the police around other institutionally misogynist. Again, so the, the so the police again are under attack, um, um, and so the question is, what's going to happen now? We've got there's enough evidence that the, the, the police around their practices. They need they need a major, major, major reform, but their leaders are in denial of that reform. And the only way you can, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed that the mayor of London might not not been able to put is there's, there's a petition going around about her that Chris Duke should be resigned. And there should be more pressure on that. That's what you can do. Write to get and write to your MP, write to the Mayor of London. I mean, that's something that we can do. Um, yeah, so I mean to answer your question, it's just the, the police are, lots, are still on loads of self until we change the way that the police are um, um the processes run police suspension, the disciplinaries are done independently, so we have a proper independent account of body that deals with police complaints, then mm -hmm. nothing will fundamentally change. Yeah, I, I was just struck by, you know, the advice that they were, that has been given out to sort of women, you know, if they're, you know, um, stopped by a lone police and that is to flag down a bus and all the rest of it, which isn't afforded to you, you know, if if you're black, basically, and I was just struck by the disparities in how you're meant to react in a certain situation, yeah. and that's why I asked the question. Yeah, well, it's um, I mean, it's it's a bit of a joke, isn't it? If this, if the police say to themselves, oh, "Don't trust us, contact contact from TFL," yeah. and then the TFL drives don't stop half the time. I've seen <laughs> other bus drivers when I've seen w women trying to run after a bus, they don't even stop. So unless there's going to be a change in guidance in TFL to say that if you see a lone person as after a certain time of the evening, they will automatically stop, then that's to be mandated. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a cop out from the police, to be quite honest. Absolutely. Thank you. Just just to end on a on a positive note, and this isn't to try and validate the conclusions of the sewer report but i do think it can help sometimes to see because even you said you know one step forward two steps back and then maybe one step forward but i um i commented um in my local community uh, in a social media group on how i'd seen a white bus driver go out of his way to stop for a black passenger okay who was sort of running down mm. the road and what i found quite interesting was um I was, people didn't find that um, surprising and they actually felt it needn't be drawn attention to because 
they felt that they were colorblind. And I've lived, lived in lots of parts of London, actually, and I don't, I do actually feel as if there is a recognition, um, you know, in some parts better than in others. Uh, if you compare this to a situation where I've seen like a black boy um, stopped from boarding a bus, um, this was in Northwest London, um, finally, when he was cleared to board the bus and I asked him, you know, what happened there? He goes, oh, I, I, it's because I'm black. Um, and that I find that really painful because it's like at his age as well, he's reconciled to being treated differently because of his race. And he doesn't really think twice about being impeded in his day because of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, I do think that there are these pockets of um greater equality even within our own society and others where um and it may be to do with the demographic as well within that particular part of society mm -hmm. um or, or the or, or whether that ethnic minority is a majority um it's quite complex in that regard yeah yeah it's uh, yeah i mean obviously there are still elements of kindness and support and people want to do the right thing and that's good, and, and I think that's quite important. But we've still got a long way to go in terms of the, uh, you know, the Martin Luther King, I have a dream type scenario, basically. I think that's what I mean. Oh, we've got one more final question then from Andrea. Go for it, or comment. Hi, yes, it's just a comment again. I just want to say that I, I completely agree with what Patrick just said there. It just shows that we still have a long way to go. You know, and, and there's no letting up. We we can't let up at all in, in any of this for, you know, us, our generation, the generation behind us. You know, we, we have to keep going in this. And I'd also like to see us more positively moving forward within Queen Mary as well. Um, I, th I don't think we've got enough of a movement within Queen Mary um, to, to move ourselves forward. Um, I'd like to see, you know, more um, schemes uh, to try and get students, black students into the university. I think it's very hard. We're in um, Tower Hamlets and yet, you know, I, I work in science and engineering and there's still a very low volume of black students. And, you know, I'd like to see more schemes, you know, how can we move forward and do do things more of, more like that? So if we're together, we can start to think of these things and perhaps try and move forward, I think. Thank you so much for that comment on Queen Mary context, Andrea, and from your school. That's really um, much appreciated. So it remains for us to, to thank Patrick for giving us his time and his insight into the Sewell report and structural racism. Thank you very much. Open your mics if you wish and just give a round of applause to Patrick. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And, uh, continue the work at Queen Mary. That's all I can say.